Thank you, Callum. Uh, we heard a lot of interesting points on the panel just now, but now we can continue to dig a little deeper into what this change actually looks like in action and on the macro level. My name is Mauro, and I'm today joined on the virtual sofa by Rafaela Camera, who is the former global head of strategy and innovation at Accenture XR, and currently a strategic advisor for a variety of market makers and early stage companies in spatial computing, including the Women in XR Fund. Welcome, Rafaela. Good morning. How is everyone? Oh, good afternoon to uh, to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here on my couch, so. Yes, you it. have the couch. Yeah, you have the sofa element covered today. Uh, perhaps you could uh, start off by telling the audience a bit about your relationship with XR and your work with its technology up, up until now. Yeah, so I, I started my career in e-commerce and digital advertising. And then I started working actually in AR and VR, mostly AR, back in 2010. And I, I say this just to, um, to explain how the technology has been used by brands uh, for quite a bit longer sometimes than, than we might even think. Back in 2010, if you remember, there was, um, we were using actually the cameras of the, of the laptops because uh, mobile phones were not, uh, were not powerful enough yet to be able to do recognition of that kind. Uh, there was an example of something done for muscle milk, uh, which is a, an energy drink. And um, it was a promotion with Shaq. Shaq had just joined the Cleveland Cavaliers. And if you just put the, the bottle in front of the camera of your laptop, Shaq would come out and would play the guitar and tell you a few other things. Um, I was even back then working on a, um, kind of like a try on clothing um, AR uh, based uh, solution to see what clothes might look like on you. It was very early, but we had won an award, a demo got a word because, uh, because it was very inventive and innovative. Again, the issue back then, even more so than now is it's this idea of trying on clothes and seeing how they fit. And you had to be in front of uh, a camera that was actually fixed in space. But this just to say, it's, it's been going on for much longer than um, sometimes we, we remember. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that. When, you, when I think of extended reality, I don't really think 10 years back in time, but I guess yeah. uh, we've seen like the foundations laid out in the, in the past decade. But um, with many people being stuck home this year, many saw 2020 as a breakthrough, breakthrough year for XR. Was there anything that surprised you about uh, XR's development this year? Yeah, I think that uh, particularly the, um, the isolation um, has accelerated the usage of XR uh, on the consumer side. So we used to really concentrate on the enterprise side and certainly on the enterprise side, anything that has to do with training or with manufacturing or help uh, in anything that had to do with manufacturing or collaboration, all those activities were already going on, bigger budgets, uh, no issues because you can provide the specific uh, devices directly to the employees and different ways of doing things. Uh, as far as consumers were concerned, we thought that uh, really the uh, explosion or the true usage of AR and VR was not going to happen until roughly 2023 when we expect to have uh, you know, a multitude of AR glasses coming out and, and, and a, few other, um, a few other tipping points from a technological perspective that we can talk about later if you want. But again, this idea of being isolated at home, now being able to uh, interact with a brand, interact with a, with a product, or even interact with one another has forced um, companies in general, from brands to uh, you know, a, a edu education companies to anyone, to really kind of like almost um, um, accelerate the usage of AR and VR in a cross-platform solution. And I've heard some other uh, panelists say something similar before. Um, the, we've, we've already been using AR uh, in mobile, for example, through lenses, um, but we now see a lot more of this uh, trying to foster an impulse buy or trying on a product, trying out a product, or even feeling like you're walking into a store, uh, into a branded store, either with web VR solutions or AR mobile solutions, obviously then extending to something that's fully immersive like VR, but not making that necessary or the only way of doing that. 
And I think uh, what we have seen, even with um, experiences that we created or solutions that we created, even for hotels and uh, you know, uh, being able to walk through a specific room and see what that looks like an event room and setting it up is that uh, end users seem to be more than willing to give up a deeper level of, in, uh, of immersion to instead, um, and instead being able to use a device that they have there with them, that could be their laptop or could be their phone, and that is a lot more familiar to them and easier uh, to use. So you mean that we perhaps should kind of give up on our approach of the purest way of thinking? Like when many of us envision AR and VR, we think about the full immersion when it's truly there. But so you're saying this year you kind of saw that even going like two and a half dimension, if we could <laughs> phrase it like that, is still already a win in terms of extended reality. Yeah, I would say that 2020 has definitely taught us to kind of like leave behind a little bit our purest views of AR and VR and embrace the usage of the technology in two and a half D and in full 3D. Um, and mm -hmm. I think we will keep on seeing more of that. And frankly, um, I, I, I believe that uh, COVID accelerated that, but it's, a, it's usually the way that emerging technologies in any case take, um, um, uh, take foot and take a stronghold. You start with small, um, um, small changes that uh, consumers are more than willing to, to make and adapt to because they're, they're smaller and they don't force them to use something completely different. So I think we will see more and more of that. And, and, and then let's not forget that um, in, I consider Snap really the, in, any, in one way or another, the uh, pioneer and the inventor for anything that has, has to do with AR. Uh, they took AR and they created the lenses many years ago, and they made that commonplace for everyone uh, to the point that no one even thinks that that's AR. They just know that it's a lens. And, and that, I think, is the way that um, now shopping, uh, going to events, uh, participating to music concerts, all of that, I think, is going to follow um, that same process. But as you mentioned, um, people might not feel like they're using VR and, and AR regularly, even though they use technologies like lenses and stuff, um, and might not feel like it's already hit the mainstream. Uh, while these considerations are on the consumer side, do you think this might affect enterprise adoption despite its clear use cases? Yeah, I think that, uh, well, look, uh, enterprises have to be able to uh, work communicate, collaborate, and sell not only to their end consumers, but also do the same thing internally uh, with their own employees. And, and they, they, they need to have much more nimble ways of doing that. Um, so I think that this is actually making it clear to any company that they have to digitize their full library of assets from products to, um, to stores, to even their manufacturing facilities or their proprietary machinery sometimes to be able to then reuse them across a variety of different uh, types of usages. Uh, that could be training, it could be, uh, um, uh, you know, it could be internal collaboration, but then it is also uh, shopping, it is uh, immersive marketing, uh, and uh, it is uh, even post-sale support uh, directly for, for consumers. Let's not forget that uh, you buy a product, but then you still, you still have to, um, you still have a life with that specific product at home. So how do you do that? And how do you provide help and, and support for that? And I think that the AR in particular comes extremely handy for that. Well, you mentioned quite an extensive uh, list of duties that companies have now to be ready for uh, to adopt XR. For, I mean, maybe smaller companies, it can be hard to justify investing in that kind of, uh, yeah, they might have a hard time justifying it now to, to see what the end point is in a few years from now. If companies have to prioritize how they approach VR and AR, are there any, uh, any, is there any advice you can give them on that? Where to start and how to, because yeah, right now you might be sitting at home, you know you wanna get into it, but what's the first step? Well, so I think that um, certainly 
one of the one of the technological tipping points that we need to reach is having enough tools that are uh, that are easy enough to use so that you don't have to go and recreate uh, expensive assets yourself. And you know, Tony was talking about Shopify before and how Shopify allows you to uh, use three D assets and then and then repurpose them to to provide shopping or or marketing for your consumers. Um, there is another company called Obsess VR that actually creates a uh, creates a, a high end. Uh, store in two and a half D in web VR, so you can browse through it and you can do different things. Um, same thing if you're looking at, for example, Snap and being able to add commerce directly to those specific lenses. So I would look at solutions that are already present and making sure that you use those to uh, start gathering insights as to what you need to do and what you want to do. And you need to start that preparation uh, before 2023, which you've said to be the real tipping point of AR. What is it that makes 2023 the big goal when it comes to extended reality? Yeah, well, so there are a few things. Um, first off, we expect um, to see the launch of a multitude of different AR glasses for consumers. And so the form factor is still something that's extremely important because uh, a VR headset is still too uh, isolating in a way of, of, of a device uh, to be able to be used regularly as you're walking around. Uh, we also expect to see improvements in display and optics, uh, certainly the proliferation of 5G uh, so that you can stream and you can access content that is certainly a lot heavier than what you normally stream directly on the web but also uh, uh, a standardized natural user interface. Right now, there is not a clear idea as to how you're supposed to interact with this content. And it's a little bit different depending on what platform you might be using. And um, the last two things that I would say is a 3D advertising platform. Uh, certainly Unity, for example, is, is working on that and has been working on that and having access to that and then to tools that, um, that required a very low code to, um, to create this type of experiences will really help. Just think about what happened with the web. It used to be very complicated to create websites. And then a variety of different tools came out to, to be able to create them much more easily. And then of course it depends on what type of business you are. If you are a target.com, then uh, you know, it's going to be your own website and uh, it will be a massive expense for you. But if you are a smaller shop, uh, you have a way to create a, a, an e-commerce site in a much uh, easier and cost-efficient way. So I guess the real message is don't shy away from this new wave of technology. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for now. Thank you for joining us, Rafaela. And I'll ask everyone to stay tuned for Startup Nation, what technology should be on your radar. We'll be right back.